Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Sally Ann Spence and uh, I'm an entomologist, so I study insects and uh, I'm a coleopterist, which means I study uh, beetles. And out of all the beetle groups I study is uh, dung beetles. And uh, I'm also a farmer. I'm running cattle and sheep on 200 acres um, and I'm married to a arable farmer and I'm a seventh, uh, well, my fourth generation farmer myself as well. So. Um, quite a long agricultural background to me as well, which is probably why I ended up with dung beetles, to be fair, because there's a, there's a big crossover there. Um, so I'm just going to take you on a very, very quick tour of dung beetles, and also why dung beetles are important, what they can do for you, what you can do for them, um, and uh, why we need to have dung beetles, and far more of them in our countryside. The one thing I want you to take away from today is just dung beetles are here, and they're awesome, and you want to do more to, to conserve them. That's, that's the main thing, if I get that across. So I spent uh, many years uh, collecting data for the IUCN report, and uh, I've travelled all over the UK to do that, looking at different farming systems, and there are so many different farming systems. I have no idea, actually, how many different farming systems there are, but I'm going around the islands, and I'm going out into big, arable, um, big livestock units, small livestock units, hill farms, on farms, on moors, farms everywhere, and there's some very, very different systems. Um, but the data that came back from that was a little bit disturbing and uh, the dung beetles in the UK aren't doing as well as we'd like them to be doing. Uh, over 50% of the species are listed as threatened um, or certainly they're compromised in one way or another, even extinct. So that was uh, quite sobering really um, and uh, you'll understand why that's really quite sobering when we go into what they do for us. So this is the uh, Coprum sonaris, it's a horned dung beetle. And it's, this is the sexiest dung beetles get. This is awesome, this little creature here. It striates when you pick it up. It squeaks like a mouse. It's brilliant. Um, and it's got a great big, if you look here, you can see it's got this great big lip around the head here. That's for shoveling up the dung as well. It's, we've lost it in this country. Um, and I've been studying it in Jersey, where it's hanging on there. And it is in Europe. Uh, and that is such a shame, because that is really moving some dung, those things. They are, they are absolutely cane cow dung. A pair of those can remove a cow pat within 12 hours very, very easily. So it's a great shame that we've lost them. Um, reintroductions, not going to happen anytime soon. Um, there's a million of different reasons for that as well. Um, but, you know, that's what we're losing. Um, and you probably don't realise the dung beetles you've got because you probably aren't looking for them. But if you haven't got them, you'll know about it because your dung's everywhere. It's the dung beetles that are moving it. So losing a species like that is really, really bad news for us. Um, so these are our three groups. We've got three groups of dung beetles in the UK. Uh, we've got the Ophophagus. They are a true scarab beetle. So they're the ones that the Egyptians were worshipping, the true scarabs. You can see by the shape of it. They're, they're quite small, um, and we've got six species. Over half of them are rare now, uh, and we've lost species. We've had species go extinct in that group as well. The geotrupids, they're the big guys, um, and uh, we've got eight species of those, over half of them are rare, and again, we've lost species in that group too. Uh, the Arphodiines at the end there, 43 species, 12 of which are quite rare, and we've had ones go extinct in that group as well. So, you know, there, there is a, a theme here that we have been losing our dung beetles. Uh, tell you a little bit about them. So the geotrupids, the big ones, uh, they can bury down. They are tunnelers, and they tunnel up to a metre below the ground, especially if you're on light soils. Not so if you have bedrock chalk or anything underneath, but if you're on light soils, they will go down about a metre or so. I have chased one deeper than that before now, and I was so relieved to find it because I had the farmer stood over me, and I was just digging and digging and digging. I know it's in here. I've gone down this far, and I really ought to find it. Uh, they will take the dung down underneath the dung pack, take it into chambers, and in that chamber, they'll pack it into a ball shape, they'll lay their egg on it, and the larvae will eat it and pupate underground. Uh, the aphodiums, the true scarabs, they're actually in little shafts underneath the dung, again, not so deep, and they tend to have brood balls stacked on top of each other. They lay their eggs, and uh, their larvae develop and pupate underground. The dwellers, or the aphodiums, they live in the dung pat, and uh, there they will let, actually breed the whole life cycle within the dung pat. Uh, some of those actually parasitise some of these, but it all gets a bit complicated, so we won't go too deep into that. However, uh, what is really quite interesting is, uh, if I come over here and show you, these guys here are living in the dung, these guys are living under the dung, 
but we don't have any rollers in the UK, and that's why many of you probably haven't come across dung beetles too much, because you're always thinking dung beetles is the David Attenborough program where it's rolling the elephant dung, the jeep stops, everybody leaps out, takes lots of photographs, and gets excited about dung beetles. And there's all the research about how they actually navigate and everything else that was done on those dung beetles. We don't have those dung beetles in the UK, and it's, uh, it's actually about food availability and competition. So in the UK, there's not much competition for dung, so our dung beetles can live in it or under it. If you go to the equator, you go around to Africa and places, there's a bit more competition. That's why they're taking it and rolling it into balls, trying to scurry away with it and hide it. And there's a whole other group of dung beetles that specialise in stealing the balls off the ones that made the balls. Then if you go to the tropics, you go to the rainforest, there's even less dung being produced. And the dung beetles there have actually adapted to hang on the anuses of the animals. So it's there on site when the dung actually drops off. So it's all about food availability and competition. And in the UK, they don't have that much competition. So you can see here, this is what a dung beetle larvae looks like. If you find a dung beetle inside a dung pad, and you find this sort of like little white curled seed-shaped larvae, all this group have C-shaped larvae, and they're all a creamy or white colour, um, then that is a dung beetle larvae. If it's inside the dung pad, it's a fodii, one of the dwellers, and if you find it in the ground underneath, it will be one of the tunneler groups. The larvae are always bigger than the actual beetle, and that goes right across insects, and that's because all the hard exoskeleton, all the horns, all the other bits and pieces, have to be made from this one thing. So the babies, if you like, are always bigger. Um, I'm going to move on. You can key out the larvae. We've just published a key. You've got to be pretty keen. Okay, you've got to be really, really into your dung beetles to go down that route if you want to start keying them out, especially as the larvae. They're really quite hard. So please don't beat yourself up if you don't want to go down that route. Um, so what do they do for you? Well, they, re they reduce pasture fouling. That's the first thing. If you've got dung on the ground surface, you're, you're losing that, that pasture availability to your livestock. So you've got some dung, your ground will be trampled on, some of your ground will be defecated on, and what's left is what your animal eats. So you really want to be removing all that dung as soon as possible. I don't know if it's better than this. Shout, no, it's better than this. Um, so that's what they're doing. That's their primary function, if you like. That's the function you most notice, is the fact that they're actually removing that dung and allowing that pasture to keep going through. The next thing they do is, if, if they're removing the dung, you don't have to harrow the field and all those sort of things. So you're reducing the use of your machinery, your labour, your diesel, all those sort of things. Um, they reduce your parasites, because you've got a whole load of parasites that... Ooh, I'm going to trap a trap of leaf. You've got a whole load of parasites that will actually develop within the animal, and they'll go through their life cycle by passing through the animal into the dung pile, then they migrate out into the grass, and then they get ingested again. If the dung is broken down really quickly, that breaks up that life cycle. Those parasites can't continue their life cycle. They have to stop at that point. That's it. They're over. So that's a really, really important thing that they do as well. They also carry a little mite on them, a phoretic mite. And if you look at that top picture, you'll see one um, just here, magnified, because they're quite small. Uh, and those mites are just using the dung beetle as a taxi. So they want to get to the dung. And when they get to the dung with the dung beetle, they drop off and they hunt down fly eggs and fly maggots, especially very young instar, the first growth rate of fly maggots. That's really good news because it's getting rid of pest species for you. Um, and also the dung beetle's happy because that reduces the competition for its food, for its own larvae, etc. So uh, that's, that's one thing that they do. So breaking down two sets of parasites, uh, really, or pest flies as well. Reduce the greenhouse gases. This is something else they do. If you've got a cow pad that falls on the floor and then it's capped in the wind and rain, it will continue to ferment and it will continue to produce methane, one of the greenhouse gases. Dung beetles are breaking it up, they're reducing that and they're stopping, well basically they're stopping, they're breaking the methane being produced. So that's another thing that they do which is really, really important. Um, they increase your pasture fertility, yes, because they're taking down the dung into the ground. Um, they're also mixing the bacteria, um, the fungi, taking that down into soil as well. So um, they're doing quite a lot for your pasture fertility. They are probably reseeding your pasture as well, or helping with the reseeding process. Uh, we've done a lot of research on that, and um, I can pretty much say that they're doing it. I haven't got the published research on that yet, because we kept losing the seeds. Uh, but in the tropics, we've got loads of evidence and published as well that they're doing a lot of reseeding capacities as well. Uh, so uh, increase the soil organic matter, goes without saying, if they're taking all that dung down below. Uh, they get rid of the, they're moving the dunk fungi and the bacteria. They're bringing the subsoil up to the topsoil. They're mixing those up as well. Um, they're improving the soil aeration. If you've got something going down to a meter, you know, that's quite impressive. 
Um, that, of course, is helping with compaction, the water quality, infiltration, soil runoff, all these different things are going on. And you think, well, you know, it's only a little beetle, it's a little bug, really, and it's making a hole underneath one pat, and that's probably not having much of an effect. However, I really chose the wrong colour to highlight this, but there's about 20 different holes under this one pat, and it's been done by geotrupids, they're going down about a metre. And that's under just one pat. Then you've got to imagine that this is the field here, and your cows are going to be patting all over it, basically, or your sheep or any other animal is going to be messing all over that throughout the year. Um, and uh, then you start to realise that actually this is quite quantifiable. They're actually doing quite a lot of good to the soil here. So it's, it's uh, basically, earthworms are tiny too, and now you know all how cool they are. These are the same. They're tiny, but they're just as awesome. So uh, talking about dung production, cattle are producing about t nine tonnes of dung a year. So that's actually quite a lot of dung that you need moved off the soil, off the surface of your field. Um, sheep, I've got to quickly check on my facts here. Sheep are 4% of their body weight, weight, so 800 kgs of dung per year on average. Horses, any horsey people here? Keep horses. Right, keep your hands up in a minute. Keep your hands up. Who here poo picks? Oh good, I don't have to make anyone hold their head in shame. Please don't poo pick your ruddy horses. Um, poo picking is habitat removal, basically. And uh, I get loads of people contact me and say, oh, I've got dung beetles. I can see them coming out of my wheelbarrow. Um, you know, they won't survive in your muck heaps. Muck heaps is a totally different environment for these creatures. They are going into a microhabitat that has to come from the animal when it hits the ground. That's where they're living. They don't go into muck heaps. You can get one or two species, but they're not really in muck heaps. and They're not doing those ecosystem services in the muck heaps. Because basically the muck heap changes its temperature, it changes its matrix, lots of things are different within a muck heap. It's a very different habitat. So if you're poo picking after horses, uh, you are removing their habitat and then you're putting it in somewhere which is actually not habitable for them. So um, yeah, I won't dwell on that. Right, so think your habitat, think small. This, this, ladies and gentlemen, is awesome, okay? That's probably the best piece of dung that you can find as far as you're going if you're a dung beetle. It's really, really tall, it's got some height in it, it's got these lovely ridges. Um, dung beetles can easily get into that dung through those ridges. It's not too wet and it's not too dry. The adult dung beetle actually mashes up the dung and it sucks out the liquids, whereas it mashes it up and the larvae eat the solids. So they're not food competing with each other either, which is quite interesting. Um, and uh, a dung pat like that is, is just brilliant. If it's a splatter, and that's not just dairy cows or anything like that, because if you have a very wet day and you've got very long grass, it's all wet and everything else, you're going to get the splatters, you're going to get loose the dung. Dung beetles don't like that. It's not a suitable habitat for them. They can drown in it. It's not deep enough to get away from predators. And it's just, it's just not suitable. So um, there's not enough actual um, habitat there for them to breed in either. And they can't pull it down into the ground if they're a tunnel. So that's not a suitable habitat. And you'll find less in that from a dung beetle point of view. Different dung beetles prefer different soil types. You get generalists. With insects, you get generalists, ones that just go anywhere and do anything and don't care. And then you'll have ones that are very, very specialised. And you need to have that look after those specialists, because if you've got specialists, you've definitely got the generalists. And um, basically, they, soil types affect them, whether they're sun, shade, um, I'm going to have a quick look to remind myself. Yeah, the substrate underneath, the dung quality, the dung age as well. You get different dung beetles going to different dung stages at different times of the year as well. We've got active winter active species. Um, we've got active species all year round. Uh, some dung beetles like the dung when it's getting drier. Some like it when it's a bit moist. Some like to live just in the crust. Some like to live only where dung falls on bare ground. So that bit of poaching you've got at the gateway or the water trough, you've got a different group of dung beetles than if you go out in the field, in the middle of the field, on the grass. Or perhaps if you've got a tree in your field or a hedge, you'll have different beetles there again. So you've got to think of it as a microclimate. So different species are going into different niches. So um, this, this next slide I'm going to show you, um, I'm not very tech, so I'm quite pleased with this slide because it actually comes up a little bit. There you go, this the first one. Um, so this particular dung pat is a photograph from uh, one of my cows, and uh, it's, uh, it's photographed over a period of one week. And um, this has come from a field that I'm keeping as optimum conditions for dung beetles. So I have different sites of research. I'm a bit obsessed about dung beetles. And uh, I've registered my home as a research centre. I'm affiliated with Oxford and I've registered my own home as a research centre because when I go out and do research with my students, I'm invariably going on a university farm and we invariably farm around the students. 
And uh, I figured that actually that doesn't always help because if it goes into policy, um, then it might not get the uptake because it might be difficult what we're doing. Uh, it doesn't get the uptake, doesn't help the species that we're trying to conserve. So I got a little bit obsessed about this and decided that actually if I registered my home or part of my home as a research centre, get my students coming on a conventional farm, we're not organic, um, This is we are part of Fed for Life Accredited, but we're not organic, um, and I could just see whether we could actually do things that were a little bit more doable within that sort of system, shall we say, um, because my husband's not going to give at all, so uh, it has to work that way. So this is on one of the field sites that is in optimum conditions. So the breeds I've chosen, the way we manage it, everything is for optimum conditions for one particular species of um, sensitive dung beetles. And uh, you'll see very quickly here how quickly it can break down when you get a really good group of dung beetles being active within a week. So it's gone. And the biological flush is really hardly existent, so you can get around the thing. It's not just the dung beetles. If you get the dung beetles in the dung, you get all the other things coming. It's a whole ecosystem that come in alongside the dung beetles. And again, they're bringing all that fungi, and then you've got the um, bacteria and everything coming in. Earthworms, you get 4% more activity of earthworms underneath, uh, no, it's not 4%, 40%, I think it is, um, activity of earthworms underneath the dung pack, which has got active dung beetles in. And uh, that's really interesting because you get all this activity from all three earthworm groups. We all know how important the earthworms are but we're learning rapidly how important the dung beetles are. And uh, basically, what we think they're doing, we thought that's great at first, but I'm beginning to wonder as a dung beetle person now whether the earthworms are actually taking the food off the dung beetles and actually aren't doing them much favour, but that's how it's working. So you've got all that soil health, think about the soil side of things going on underneath the dung pack. Uh, and then, of course, once the dung beetles are there and you've got all that ecosystem there, they're food for lots of other things, so they come in. And you'll often see jackdaws, especially at this time of the year, breaking up the dung packs, looking for the dung beetles and all the other beetles in there. You've got other birds coming in um, as well, and then your wind and rain. So if you go out into your field and you find your dung pack that has actually had beetle activity in it, and this is, this is really much, very much if you're a sheep, if you've got sheep, you'll find dung packs which are, you know, sheep packs. I don't know what you call sheep, though, to be fair. I don't know I'm looking at you. You're like, oh, look at me. Um, but basically, if you pick those up, you'll find that they're, they're hollowed out. They're just a, like a little honeycomb where the dung beetles have worked them out and dried them up. And if you pick it up, it won't smell. And if you rub it between your hands, it will just break down to a dust. And that's the activity of dung beetles. And that's what you want, because then the wind and the weather and the rain can get in and break it down as well and release absolutely everything back in the cycle. So dung beetles are affected by the time of day. Some, they're pretty much all nocturnal and tend to fly at night. Uh, no, they're not. What am I talking about? Some of them are nocturnal. A lot of them are daytime flying as well. Um, and at 15 degrees is a pretty magical time. If it's a nice warm day, go out there, sit by your dung pack if you can, and, uh, and have a poke around ideally as well. You'll get into this, I warn you, it's, it's very addictive because you don't quite know what you're going to find each time you go through it. So um, it's, it's a bit like unwrapping Christmas stocking, really. Um, <laughs> but basically, yeah, so you get, you get quite a lot of different dung beetles. But if you sit there, especially on a warm day, and it's the emergence of a particular couple of big species, we get big, huge emergences of speculatus and prodomus twice a year. And uh, I've had them coming in and just hitting my hair, getting tumbled up and everything else. There's loads of them. So they'll be out and around as well. The decomposition state of the dung pack, as I said, different species going at different stages. The type of dung. I've been all over the place looking at different animals' dung. Our, our dung beetles aren't very keen on some of the introducings. Rhino at Cotswold Wildlife Park, didn't find many in there. Um, buffalo farms, we've got five of them. Or bison farms, we've got five of them or eight of them or something in the UK. Uh, generalists in there, none of the specialists like them. Um, which is an interesting thing. So here's, here's a fact for you. In fact, I've brought me round to that. How important are dung beetles? So the Australian cattle and sheep industry is based on dung beetles. Okay? Because when they brought the, the, all the cattle and sheep over to Australia, um, they found that they had a huge increase in pest flies. And those were flies that were also not only taking disease to animals, but to humans as well. You know, the corks around the hat, that whole idea of the corks around the hat. So in the 1950s, they had a guy going over from Hungary, I think it was, and he started to have a look at the root problem they'd got. They were losing, rapidly losing pasture, and they had this parasite problem and all sorts of other things going down. Because the dung was still present. It wasn't breaking down. And uh, the flies could breed in it, so they were doing okay. And the numbers were going huge, and there was nothing controlling the amount of dung on the floor, and losing pasture, and it was just going horribly wrong. So what they did was they started to look at the dung beetles in Australia, because they have dung beetles in Australia. They've got loads of them. And they realised very quickly that those dung beetles have evolved and adapted only to marsupial dung, and they couldn't actually digest. They weren't palatable 
to the cow and cattle, uh, sheep dung that was now there in vast numbers. They hadn't had time to adapt to it at all. So they weren't eating it. So in the 1960s, the Australian government, working with the universities as well, they actually started to look, research different dung beetle species that could survive in Australia from different places. So this was happening in Tasmania, Australia, and New Zealand. And they were bringing in dung beetles from Africa and Mexico, and, and there's a couple of northern hemisphere species, couple of, one or two species that we actually have in this country, the big geotrupids. And uh, they were breeding them in captivity and then releasing them out. And they're, they're releasing them out in certain soil types because these dung beetles, especially the tunnelers, only like certain types of soils. And that was actually the kickstart of the industry and actually puts the industry back on its feet. So that's how important dung beetles are. When you haven't got dung beetles, you will notice it. When you've got them, you won't notice them. But when you haven't got them, it can actually take the livestock off your farm. Yeah, yeah, sabotage their dung beetles and you'll be fine. That's, yeah, that's, that's what it is. I didn't say that, please don't quote me that. Right, so what else are you going to find in your dung? Because when you go and see your dung, you'll be telling me you've seen lots of beetles, and you probably have, but there's every chance that they're not dung beetles because there's lots of other beetles that live in dung. Three main groups are the hydrophilias, these guys here. They're a water beetle, they've adapted to live and breed in dung, um, especially wet dung, so they're one of the primary colonizers of dung. These guys will actually eat some dung. There's two species in particular we eat some dung. Their larvae, though, are pretty predatory. That's what their larvae do. And then the staphylinids, the road beetles. They're manic, those things. Um, beautifully shaped, perfect for going down tunnels and things. They're a predator as well. And this beast of a creature at the end here, absolute tank, this is scary. I mean, admittedly, they're all about this big. Um, but that thing is absolutely incredible. And that just munches through anything it finds. It's its size, slightly bigger and definitely smaller. So if you're collecting dung beetles, do be aware you don't want to put one of these in the pod, pot with them because you won't have any dung beetles to look at afterwards because they just, they just go through them. So these beetles will be active in your dung. And uh, you can find out the, well, you can identify them quite easily because they're fast moving, they're predators. So if you get something in your dung and it's whizzing in and out of holes, it won't be a dung beetle. Dung beetles are herbivores, they're quite slow moving. Invariably they play dead if you get them out as well. And that's, that's what they do, because if basically if I've died of something, you don't know what I died of, and if you eat me, you might die as well. That's the sort of fail-safe that they're going for there. Um, and so they'll either play dead, or they'll just slowly get up and they'll start to walk around. All dung beetles can fly, so don't be surprised if you get it out and it just flies off. They can all fly. Um, dung beetles have a clubbed, up, clubbed antenna, and that's to maximise their smelling ability, so they can actually smell dung from further away. So they'll often hold their antenna down when you find them, because they don't want it broken or damaged and then they'll hold it up and flare out the, the, the leaves. And they do that, they're getting ready to fly as well. So you find lots of other things in dung. These things come into dung in bigger numbers where there's been dung beetle activity. And all those things uh, are really important for the biodiversity on your farm. They're all either beneficial insects or pollinating or predatory, predating, predating, sorry, or they're part of the um, breaking down and recycling the detritus. Uh, what's quite interesting on this list here as well is parasitic wasps. Because as these guys go in and out of the dung, especially these guys, they're opening up tunnels. That allows dung beetles in as well. Because dung beetles can bury their, their own way in, but there's a tunnel already there. They won't, won't be fast, path of least resistance, and they'll go down that. Um, but if there's a tunnel being opened, the little tiny, tiny parasitic wasps will appear on the dung pad, tiny. And they will go in and they will actually lay their eggs on the fly and larvae that are inside the dung pad as well in the fly eggs. So they're quite cool. So it's a whole system. So basically it's about getting your dung pack as a really good environment, a little environment within itself, a whole healthy ecosystem. And that will be affecting the life of your soils and also the biodiversity both above and below ground. So um, dung beetles and earthworms, here we go. Yes, good pasture management should have the goal of keeping nutrients excreted by livestock in your soils basically, which is what they're doing, recycling it as fast as they can. Um, earthworms move into dung quickly. As I say, there's a lot of work now showing that earthworms are probably taking uh, the dung beetles' food as well in many respects, but it's all very good for the, the soil health in that respect. Um, so, and all three earthworm groups have been recorded active under dung beetle packs as well. So I'm moving on from there. But more research is needed. Very quickly, I do want to put this out there. Nuffield, there's lots of young, young faces here. If you can do a Nuffield, please do. Uh, and do research. We, we've got very little research beyond um, uh, those main basic things on dung beetles, especially. Um, we don't have much on their natural history 
we're woefully behind in an awful lot of the data we need on them um, that will certainly help us with uh, potential reintroductions or anything else in the future. We don't know very much about their flight act plans. We don't know how far they actually do fly. At the moment, I'm doing research to see how high they fly because uh, we know that uh, we've got a couple of species that are having a bit of a hard time getting across the M5. So um, insects are very funny on things like this. If you think about the, uh, the um, I'm trying to think what it's called, uh, Dutch elm, does it? The Dutch elm beetle, you know, that only flies at a certain height. Um, and lots of insects only fly at certain heights. So that would be interesting what's happening there. And as I say, how far they're flying as well um, will have a big effect. Because as we're losing livestock, you're fragmenting their habitat. Um, and I need to know more about how far we can fragment habitat for them as well and still get there. So this is the soil biology. Uh, healthy soil is a living ecosystem with a good combination of soil biology, soil structure, soil chemistry, organic matter content, plenty of air, um, and water infiltration. Dung beetles do all of that. I see everyone has got a tick beside it, because dung beetles do all of them. They're making those holes, um, they're taking the dung down, they're mixturing up the fungi and the bacteria, they're releasing all that organic matter out there, they're increasing your soil structure, they're, you know, there's just so much they're doing. They're doing all of it. They're doing all of it. And you don't have to get involved at all. It's brilliant. Right, threats and conservation, here we go. Um, climate change. Climate change is really affecting dung beetles. It's affecting a lot of insects. These are tiny things, and the slightest change in temperature does affect them. Uh, and what you're getting in particular are these really early warm spells, these sudden warm spells. You know that week in sort of February, where we're all in our jumpers and being miserable and just it's cold, and you're, you're trying to melt all the water you know, pipes around the farm, and it's just horrible. And then all of a sudden, it's so bright, everybody's having a barbecue and sunburn the next week, and then you're all back to being miserable and cold again. And what's happening there is these dung beetles are merging into huge numbers. They're coming out, and the food's not there because the animals are still in, or they just haven't been able to access the animals. And then suddenly, you've got that cold snap afterwards, and it's wiping out a whole load of breeding beetles. Um, so, you know, this sort of uh, snap changes in temperature isn't doing them any help. Livestock removal. If you remove the livestock, you may lose their habitat. That's that. That's the end of that. That's a localised extinction bang, just like that. So it's, um, you know, livestock has its place very much so in our countryside. Uh, change in land use, well, that's pretty much the same as livestock you, uh, removal. Any golfers here? People play golf? They're all like, I'm too scared to put my hand up, she's going to tell me off. Yeah, I'm not a fan of golf courses because they invariably got put over the top of my Onthophagus whole strongholds. And uh, I look at a lot of data in museums. If I've got the specimen and I've got the label, I've got the data, I know that that beetle existed at that place at that date. And nine times out of ten, when my uncle Vegas, I get all excited because they like sandy soils. I get all excited and I look on Google Earth and there's a bloody golf course. Um, so, yes, so change of land use, not good. Uh, soil disturbance. So, dung beetles are actually either in the pats or they're living underneath it. Uh, so is their larvae. Their pupils, pupil, uh, pupa, sorry, is developing there as well. If you go and rip through it with tines or plows or anything, um, harrows, anything, you are actually opening them up and allowing them to be predated and you're, you're going to be disturbing at the stage of their life cycle. Um, so that's not good for them as well. Then down the bottom there is chemical treatments. I have not put chemical treatments at the top of the list because actually, you know, these are all together doing things, but this is definitely a straw that's breaking the chemical chemicals back, as they say. Um, so chemical treatments is something we're going to be looking at in a minute. When you're using any of your products to treat parasites on livestock, you are using an insecticide, and it is killing insects. Simple as that. It's doing what it needs to do to the parasites, but it has a life beyond your animal, and uh, that's where it's coming into trouble. Uh, and over here, so that's a handful of lo lovely Athobiaean dung beetles, babies, very cute. Over here is an island that has one farm on it, and um, it's, it's a little way off the coast, and uh, there they have been using treatments, as, as prescribed, as, as a lot of us have always done. Um, and uh, what they've done over time is actually lose their dung beetles. And uh, the dung beetle numbers are so low uh, that the parasite burden got higher and higher. The dung on the ground got higher and higher. Um, they kept doing, using more treatments. And uh, basically, that's a broken cycle. And the animals have been removed off the island. And we're trying to work out how we can get the whole thing going again. Um, so it's quite a real thing. Islands are great for studying. If you want to see a system break down very quickly, the best thing to do is go and find an isolated island, remove one species and see what happens. 
because it happens a lot quicker than anywhere else. Uh, so the conservation, what can you do? I'm going to tell you now the best things that you can do, and you won't be able to do them all, so I'm going to tell you. Um, so alternative parasite controls, don't worm, don't, don't treat parasites, try other things. Um, that's probably not very useful to a lot of you. There is a thing called animal welfare, and uh, we have got a problem that if we ban the other mechanisms and things that tomorrow, we haven't got a lot else we can use, but we will talk about that in a minute. Um, so I'm quite realistic on that. I don't expect you all to stop worming everything immediately. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Is there anything I can do other than click extra? I'm going to tell you, but basically, selectively treat, which is labour intensive in a way, especially in August when you're trying to combine if you're yeah and all the rest of it. But yes, that's yeah, that's where you're coming from on that one. Um, so quarantine pasture. If you're treating. Have a field that you can put them in. Again, this is optimum things. If you can do this, it's awesome. Okay. If you do one of these things, it's awesome. I'm realistic enough to know that you can't do everything. Um, so basically, if you can keep your animals that you're treating in one field in particular, you write off the dung in that field, you've still got good, healthy dung elsewhere. Um, winter grazing, if you can keep animals out all year, or some stock out yet all year, dry cows or bull, even a bull or two, you know, anything, keep it out all year. Sheep are probably more unlikely to be out all year. Um, but basically you've got those winter active species and as we're getting these climate change spikes There's dung on the ground for those ones that emerge at that time and they're not supposed to be uh, Native breeds are best Okay, native breeds are best um, And this is because our dung beetles have evolved alongside our native breeds and adapted to their dung um, They just you know, they're quite connoisseurs of dung and uh, They do like their own own breeding um, Native breeds dung best of all they will go into other dung, but that's the best dung for them Unimproved pasture is definitely the best. They're, they're not very keen on nitrogen. Some of the sensitive species, uh, nitrogen is having an effect on them in their pupil and larval development, underground in particular. Um, so unimproved pasture, just left alone, not touched. They love that. They love that. You put, you put all these in here together, and they're, they're really happy little bunnies. Um, so, and then horses. Yeah, we won't bang on about the horses and poop picking again. That just depress me. Um, right, so... Making a chemical choice for your dung beetles. So this is where we were talking about your click. Um, if it's a long-acting treatment, absolutely six to eight weeks, isn't it? I think. Nineteen weeks of cover. Nineteen weeks of cover. There you go. That's, that's, yeah. So you're looking at nineteen weeks of toxic dung, basically, and then that toxicity drops off as the chemicals activity drops off. Um, and uh, this is this is a big problem. Um, so uh, try not to use long-acting if you can. Um, and uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but basically, any insecticidal treatment you use will have an effect on the dung beetles. They, the, they have sublethal and lethal effects. So recently treated animals will produce quite a lot of that, that um, toxic dung. As we've got, um, I don't know about the name toxic, but yes, basically it's toxic dung. And uh, so the dung beetles that get to that first will eat it and will potentially die. Um, and uh, like I said, you'll still see beetles because you'll see those other beetles in the dung that aren't actually eating the dung, beet dung itself, but they're living in there because it's a habitat for them. Uh, and then what happens after that is you get a range of sublethal effects as the chemicals break down. And those increase include navigational problems, includes uh, fertility problems, includes development problems in the pupa and in the larvae. So it's not good news. We have no stuff. Um, if there's anyone who doing wants to do enough field or anything, we have no data on the effects of urine of it in urine on soil um, invertebrates and things as well. So there's a whole load of work there. Uh, we have got a page. I'm, I'm here today with dung beetles from farmers, and uh, we've got the stand there on the other side. We've got an awful lot of information on our website as well um, on this particular subject. So uh, what can you do? Um, yeah. One of the things you can do immediately is reduce your usage of um, insecticidal treatments and try and do it selectively. That is a big plus. Because even if you have to treat one or two animals, you've still got the majority of them not producing that dung that will, will have those effects. So you can actually help them quite a lot. These are insects, so they will bounce back. They will breed and build up their numbers again quite quickly, but they need to have the right habitat and no poison, if you like, around there to do it. So um, basically, uh, only treat your animals that have got parasite burden. And uh, you know, think about that in your breeding program. 
We often think about our oh, animals, oh, they're not going to breed from that because it's got dodgy feet, or I'm not going to breed from that because it's, it's only ever producing singles or whatever. You know, all these various things. Think about your parasite burden. Make a note. Selectively treat your animals and make a note of the ear tag of every animal you have to treat. And if it's a second offender, keep your eye on it. If it's a third time, strike out. Don't breed from it. Um, we didn't used to have such a large amount of parasites, if you like, in our national herd and the national flock pre-war because basically you didn't breed from them because they were dead. It's a bit like that old saying, you know, if, you're, if your parents didn't have children, chances are you won't either. You know, it's, it's, it's we, we've basically, we've, we've bred, you know, we've allowed this to happen ourselves, not, not unknowingly and not badly, but we've done this because we've had the chemicals to treat the parasites. So we've been able to hide them in our systems, if you like. Um, so have a breeding plan looking at the naturally resistant animals. If you've got your own animals, your own replacers, you'll have less chance of parasites because they're more likely to have a natural resistance to the parasites where you are anyway. And if you're bringing animals in, then again, put them through a quarantine system. You know, it's, it's, it's basic husbandry on that point of view. Um, so yes, consider removing them. Do remove them. That really wants to be do. Um, so uh, talk to your vet. Work with your vet on this. Vets are really open to this. And they're getting more and more open as well. Um, it's something that's coming in. It's not, you know, everybody's on board with this one. Uh, you're, you can do blood tests, you can do fetal egg counts and things like that. You can do them yourselves, but, well, fetal egg counts you can, but, um, you know, get your vets on board, do this. Uh, it might well save you money in the long run if you think how much you're spreading, spending on your parasite management plans as well. Um, you know, this can happen. I had, I had a really good day the other day because I do a lot of work with cluster groups and uh, I spoke three years ago, was it pre-COVID, about three years ago, at uh, one group and uh, said to everybody in the group, again, you know, just do this. Don't blanket treat. Stop the blanket treating. I know you're likely to treat young stock more, but you really shouldn't be treating your adult animals hardly at all. You know, just think about it. And um, then we had a meeting with the same group and uh, one of the farmers came up and said, you know, I actually took on board what you said, so that was a good start. And uh, he said, um, you know, when, when I went home, we've always treated three times a year, blanket treat everything, because that's what we've done. That's our management plan. Never really thought about dung beetles. Never really thought about any of that. And I don't expect him to have done, to be honest with you. Um, and uh, he said, but I did look into it. And we stopped treating and we decided that we would actually go down this route because it made sense that if we're treating all these animals all the time, we shouldn't really have any parasites anyway because we're constantly treating don donkey's ears. So where are the parasites particularly coming from? Because we're breeding our own replacers and everything else. And uh, he said, so that's what we've done. And he said, you last year saved me £3,000. So I was quite chuffed about that. So I said, oh, I'm going to quote that every time I go out there. I've got a sea of faces, all those farmers sitting there going, oh, yeah, right, here we go. Um, but yeah, so it can, it is good, you know, in that respect. Um, you don't necessarily need to treat your animals. And if you do need to keep treating the same animals, you know, don't breed from it, get rid of it. It's, it's not a good doer anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, think about that in your breeding plan. Uh, keep animals off clean pasture for at least one week after treatment. Yeah, it depends on your treatment length again. You know, when we talked, when I was at Ag College, um, they always taught us that you treat your animals as you put them out to pasture when they've been indoors through the winter. You know, don't do that. If you are wanting to treat them before you put them out, there's probably no reason to do that because you'll put them out on clean pasture anyway. Um, but if you do want to treat them beforehand and you've had them tested and they do need treating, treat them if four weeks before inside. You can get to them while they're inside before they get out in the field. It's not easier to treat them then anyway. Um, there's no reason why you can't treat them beforehand a couple of weeks early. Then if they do go out, the dung is less toxic when they go out in that field. You don't want to be killing off those dung beetles when you need them most, when you put those animals out first. So you want to try and do it that way. Don't underdose where your animals. This is really important because we're talking about resistance in, our, in, uh, in a lot of these chemicals anyway. Um, rotate. If you can keep different animal species, do please do. If you keep horses amongst your cattle, go pick up the dung. Um, avoid treating all stock. Yeah, so again, you know, just basically looking at uh, selective treatment. And then if you're reseeding, think about what you're reseeding with. If you can get plantain, uh, trefoil, um, what have we got? Chicory, sandfoin. You know, these are natural antiparasitics. Uh, they will, they're not the miracle cure in many respects. I wouldn't say that um, they will knock out every parasite you've got, but if you've got animals that have already been you know, quite good on natural parasite suppression, these will help a huge amount. Um, I've looked at various different things, and this, this is something I'm quite interested in. I've been working with the effects of tea tree oil on cattle mites, on bovine mice. Um, it does work. 
probably because the mites can't hold on to the, the hair. But you have to rub it on the tree tree oil four times a day. <laughs> so, you know, I could publish on that, but I would say there's going to be a slight problem implementing it, um, certainly on the buffalo farms. So, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, add it to your armory. Get these plants in there. There's loads of mix. Um, there's people here today that have got these in their mixes as well. Uh, you can get these into your grasslands. Right, I'm going to go here. So after this talk and the questions, uh, I'm going to be taking you all out on a dung beetle safari, if you'd like to come along, and actually understand how you can find dung beetles and try and contextualise everything that I've been banging on about to you. Um, we're going to be taking you out in a minute and going up the field here to have a look at some dung for these dung beetles that are mob gra uh, cattle that are mob grazing up here. So there you go. That was a whistle-stop tour of dung beetles. nothing else you know just just understand they're there and you need them you really do need them can you imagine what it'd be like if you didn't have them and and it's you know pasture fouling is a major problem um that alone let alone everything else and uh, with the the optimum site i've got now i've actually got a problem when i take students there to find the dung because it's really hard to find dung and that's that i'd love that right across my farm but there's there is quite a lot of management to that because i'm having to manage those animals on on all sorts of reasons. And farming isn't, isn't easy. Um, you might not have liver fluke or something, or some, I don't know, something one year, and you might well have it next year. Fly strike might be a real problem one year, and not, not the next because of the weather and things like that. There's a whole load of reasons why one management plan doesn't always work, but it's about being flexible and trying your best and trying to minimize the use of those chemicals, because that's the problem. If you've got livestock, you, you've already helped the dung beetles. You're already helping them. That's really important. If you've got a mixture of livestock, that's even better. And if you've got livestock out all year round, that's awesome. So the problem you're hitting, really, is how you treat those fields, whether you're disturbing the soils, whether you're disturbing the turf, and whether you're using those chemicals. That's where your problem is. Um, so it's break down to what, where you think the problem area might be, and then trying to address it. And if you could selectively treat, that would be huge. I'm not going to tell you not to treat other animals, because there's an animal welfare issue with that, and you're going well not to treat any of your animals, you know, especially with young stock. But there is a very high chance that you probably don't need to be treating as much as you are. And so that's a good thing to be saving money and also to help my dung beetles. So you get a big thumbs up from me for that one, really. Yes? I read on your Yeah, absolutely. So um, you do get winter active species, but there's less species and there, there are lower numbers. Um, but if you don't have that dung on the floor when we have these really warm climate spikes, that huge emergence, there's, there's two particular ones that are goldy coloured. Um, and uh, they emerge in massive numbers. They'll literally, they'll come into your sheep field in particular and just be gone. Um, if you don't have that dung for them, they, they won't be able to survive when it flips back to a really cold spell. So it's about keeping the next lot going. That's really, it's more important than ever now with, with the climate changes we're getting. Do other people specifically have sheep more than the, with the cattle ones, the sort of overwinter on the sheep? Yeah, so you get you get different species are quite sensitive to certain breeds, or sorry, certain livestock species, if you like, but most of them will, will hop. Um, you get, uh, so uh, Typhaeus, what is Typhaeus called? Minotaur beetle, that's a dung beetle. Um, it's got these amazing three three horns on it, it's a really cool beetle. Uh, that was originally, there was a huge entomological row over this particular beetle, because a lot of people wanted to classify it as a roller, the UK's only roller. Um, but to be a roller, you have to, I'm old school, so you have to pack the dung together actively into a ball and then roll it away. Um, but this beetle will roll dung, but it likes dry deer dung and dry sheep dung in that pelleted form. So it's not truly making a, 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 a roll, a ball really. Um, but that specialises in that type of dung. So that beetle will only be on that type of dung in that, that type of form. Um, whereas others are fine. Roof of peas, roof of peas is everywhere. Um, that I found that on the on the tide mark of the shoreline of the Isle of Arran in deer dung, you know that's that's not general dung beetle, but it was there. Um, and uh, you, you just you just get different ones in different niches. But if the dung is there, um, you will always get that dung beetle. So if it's good dung, they will be there. 
Yes. No, put them out. Is put them out. Anyway? Yeah, if you've got sheep, that's great. Put some cattle out, you'll get the deer tree pits going into that, the real big ones, um, because they're more dung. They like the, the deer tree pits will go into sheep dung, um, quite happily go into sheep dung, especially if it's a good pile, you know, when they've been sleeping and then they get up and you get that real big pile. Um, that's, uh, sorry, I'm really into my dung. Um, so you'll get, you'll get quite, they'll like that, but they like cattle and horse as well, because they like, and they're big beetles, they like a large amount of dung, basically. So yeah, get, get, keep animals out if you can on you. Uh, and if you can keep them out overnight, just keep them out. You know, a couple of old cows out the back there. Get the children to bottle rear something and have it around the back there. That's how most sheep flocks have started, actually, I think, in the UK. Yeah. Will they come? Will they yeah, they will, because they're flying. Um, but we just don't know how far they're flying, but you will definitely get beetles coming quite quickly. And quite quickly, like literally within an hour, um, they will appear. So it's not something that you won't get dung beetles for years, you'll get them quite quickly. The, you want to build up your species list though, and that takes a bit longer, but they will, will arrive. Um, this is why I'm quite keen to get that data. I've been, I've been harassing uh, places like Rothamsted and things because I want their little flight chips, you know, they've been measuring the bee flights and things. And uh, I've got a, a friend who's, a, who's working there at the moment, and I said to him, can I have, just, can I just borrow a couple? Because this is really quite important data. I can't get funding to do this, but it's really important data. Um, and he's like, no, Sal, because I don't want you, your dung beetles going in the ground and in dung. And I don't, my chips are really expensive. And it's like, well, they're not very good chips, and they're designed for us to be able to find something if they lose them. But, you know. Um, but yeah, so we just need that, that data to find out how far they're flying. Two miles is definitely doable, definitely doable. I suspect species have different flight rates and distances because obviously we've got a huge variety of size. Um, but they will be there quite quickly, definitely. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Yeah, this is something we can't quite do here yet because uh, it's, it's a lot of it's to do with soil types. So it starts off with the ethics of collecting and uh, where we can collect from um, and things like that because sometimes it's SSI sites that got the best dung beetle populations and obviously you can't collect from there and things like that. So first of all it starts with collecting, then it starts with the diseases and bacteria and fungus that the dung beetles have got on them. Um, we obviously don't want to move dung beetle attacking fungi from around the country either. Um, and then the big problem has been just generally getting them through their life cycle. Uh, they're not bringing captivity terribly well. Uh, I've been working with the Bristol Invertebrate um, Unit to try and see if we can get some of them breeding some of our rare beetles, and we are struggling with it, so it's, it's not working. So the way in Australia, they actually got, I think, I can't remember, don't quote me on this, she says it's being recorded. Um, I think it was about 140, 160 species they looked at, and they're actually only releasing about 30 or 40 or something. It's, it's not, you know, so a lot of them didn't make the captive breeding program. Um, so that's, yeah. It, I, I would like to see, our dung beetles are here, basically. Our extinct ones are, are extinct. Um, and rather than concentrate on them at the moment, I'd like to make sure the ones we've got hanging on are in better state. So, um, you know, it's more of a case of making sure that we've got better you know, habitats for what we've already got and increase their numbers. And then we'll, you know, perhaps go the other way. I'd certainly love to see coppers here. I mean, when I found coppers, I was crying. You know, I'd only seen it dead in collections for years, so to actually find it, it was squeaking around my hand. I was so excited. I was just ridiculous. I just got off the plane, I hadn't even got to my hotel, and there was just one field that looked right, and it's like, oh yeah, that's where I'm going. Um, and I'm, under my photo, I'm absolutely covered because I've got the glasses and the cars get thumbing down, I've put my glasses back up, and I haven't got my gloves on, there's shit all over my face. But it was a very exciting moment for me anyway. You have to be into dung beetles. You will get into dung beetles if you start looking for them. Uh, one thing, though, I must say to you all is, do not um, get bogged down with trying to identify them to species level. Uh, I've been working for dung beetles for a very, 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 very long time, and uh, I still find it hard to identify all of them down to species level, and invariably it involves a microscope, because it might be one tiny little dot on their body that makes them a different species. Um, so it's, it's a case of recognise the three groups. Can I whiz back? How am I doing for time? Brilliant. So if you go back here, Ah. Keep going back, keep going back, keep going back, 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 back. Right, uh, you know, recognise them to body shape. You've got the ones on the end, sort of like almost pill-shaped, 
there's a much rounder, true scarab, and then you've got the quite big ones, and they're all quite big ones in that group. You know, you recognise them to body shape, you really want a representation of all three. If you can get a representation of all three, that's great. If you get them out in their different colours, count the colours, and you've already got well, however many species those are. On our identification sheets, um, just because it's gold here, it might not be gold if you're at the top of a mountain in Wales, because actually altitude can affect their coloration. We don't know why. In fact, we don't even know why they're coloured. Um, they're, they're in dung and in soil, so why are they even coloured? Um, but yes, don't go necessarily by the colour. Um, they are just generally quite hard to identify. I have to key certain ones out for quite some time. It's, it might be the shape of their mandibles, or as I say, it might be a dot or something. We don't tend to go by colour because you get so much changing that. In fact, there's a rare dung beetle of a geotrupid, it's called mutator, and it comes with a whole load of colour forms. So that's what it does. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, when you're keying them out, we have whole books. So if you do get into it, and you start thinking, oh, actually, I've, I've got these dung beetles, but I actually do want to know my species, and I do want to do it, get yourselves a microscope, and you can start having a look at them a little bit closer, and you can buy keys and download keys. We have lots of keys, but you can literally go through it a bit. A bit like one of those old stories where you have to choose which way you dive at the end of the story each time. Um, but basically you choose which one you think it's most like. So has it got this shape? Has it got that? Follow it to this and so on. And hopefully you'll key it out. I record. So what you can do is you take a decent photograph. Please take a decent photograph. Um, and you take a photograph from the top, the side and underneath and put it on I record. That will go through to a data person who looks at scarabs and uh, they will be able to verify what species it is. It's still not 100% off photographs, we're always a bit nervous, but if it's a decent photograph, please do it. And, and decent photographs means so much. I get photographs that are blurred, and it's like, well, I don't know what it is, but it's obviously fast, um, you know. Um, so, you know, quality of photos are really important. Um, while they're playing dead, they'll only play dead for the first couple of times, and you get them out, they're like, oh, no, I, I don't know what's happening, I'm going to play dead. But then they get used to the fact you haven't eaten them, so they won't keep playing dead, but while they play dead, it's a good idea to photograph them then. Um, but yeah, don't go by colour alone. But there are there are keys. There's lots of keys. You know, you can jess up some things in these keys you can find. Um, there's lots of data and, and papers on dung beetles as well. An awful lot on the effects of avamectin. All you need to know, know is it's bad. Um, but that's been a well-funded subject. So um, there's lots of papers on that as well um, that you can access to. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, and then um, I was talking to someone earlier on about this. The, uh, the other way that we can also identify them is this is all exoskeleton. It's, it's hard, and when the beetle dies, the, um, the insides all basically rot away and disappear. And, and that's really, this is what gets you into entomology. They're so cool. All their exoskeletons are different, and they're really beautiful, and they're very different. All of yours, I hate to say it, are terribly boring. You're all the same. Um, you know, your, your skeletons are pretty standard, all right? Uh, but theirs are awesome. We've got three totally different ones there for a start. Uh, the the Adeus, the, the uh, penis on the, on the male reproductive organ of a dung beetle, is uh, inside its body. However, it comes outside the body and as such is made of the same stuff as an exoskeleton. So when everything rots on them, that stays behind. Not the same for you boys, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, that's quite handy because I can then remove it and I have a whole book, a whole book of well, several books on how to key them out from those because they're all different, and that's really important because we don't, they don't all interbreed. They're all living in the same habitat, but they're not interbreeding, and that's because the keys don't always put the same locks. And uh, that's another way that we can identify them. So if you really get into it, you have to invest in things like uh, books on on beetle penises. There you go. There's a there's a whole new thing for your library at home. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's different ways to identify them. But what I really want you to do more than anything else is just know that what's a dung beetle and what's not, and uh, whether you've got different species within the fact that they just look different, um, that's enough, really. Don't, uh, you know, but I'm not trying to tell you not to identify them to species level by any means, but just be aware it's not easy, and don't expect to be um, not frustrated by learning how to do it. Um, but, you know, do do it, but prepare to spend some time doing it. Yes? You said that um, the beetles don't like nitrogen-rich soils. Would that be the same for um, organic high clover soils as, as for conventional? No, because the, the nitrogen-fixing plants is a, is a more natural sort of fertiliser, really, nitrogen, so that doesn't seem to have the effect. It's on the sensitive species. Um, we haven't got a lot published on this yet, um, but basically there is, there is a correlation between 
an effect on the, on the beetle um, larval development. Probably very much in the pupal stage, especially when it's at that liquid stage, because things can leak through the, um, the, the casing of the pupa, basically, um, because it's, it's breathable, it's got breathable all the way through. Um, and that's probably having the effect there as much as anything else. But yeah, nitrogen fixing plants are absolutely fine. That's that's a totally you know it's a different side of things, definitely. Yes. What would you recommend for flight control in couples? Yeah, I mean, it's, if this is, I wish I had the magic wand. You know, uh, I'm sure none of us would like to use chemicals at the end of the day, um, even if it's just for the bank balance. Um, anything you use will have an effect. So. It's a case of, uh, how would you say it? I can't recommend anything that's good um, unless you're completely off the chemical side of things. And then it's a case of just keeping an eye on those animals. How, you know, do you, at what point do you need to treat them? How far can you let them, you know, is, is the weather going to change suddenly and the problem goes away and all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's almost by the seat of your pants or things like that. Um, but, yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, this is my problem. I, I, this is why I'm against the removal of apamectins immediately overnight, because what are you going to use instead um, in some cases? And, and it's a case of just, if you can selectively use. And with cows, you, you'll notice if you watch the cows um, that certain ones tend to get flies more than others. Um, and uh, that's an interesting one, taking note of them. Uh, and they sometimes go in cluster with the ones that haven't got the flies as well. Um, but yeah, again, it's selectively treat, if you can selectively treat. Um, and if you selectively treat it, then the percentage of your dung is still still good to go. Um, chemical wise, oh, I've got a vet on board with me today, so um, one of our team, so um, she can help you a little bit. But the end, you know, from my point of view, an insecticide is an insecticide. So, yeah, it, it comes back down. Sorry. Yeah, garlic. There's also the. I had an old boy who told me that uh, they used to put. Um, oh, it was on horses. Uh, elderberry leaves in the head collars and things like that and, and uh, I tried that and actually that did work but was it the leaves just flicking the elderberry you know the flies off or, or which way um, yeah garlic can help um, there's all sorts of you know as again you're sort of yeah garlic I'm trying to think what else there's something else as well I can't remember what there's something else it's organic yeah yeah, I mean, the thing to avoid are those fly tags, because again, you know, they're, they're releasing into the body. Anything goes into the body, it's quite frightening, actually, how the chemical is going through the animal and how much it's affecting the, the insect. But you've got to think about how small that insect is. Um, so, yeah, there's, I think, yeah, you're right, there's one in the organic. I'm just trying to think what the, the fly, because there was a guy the other day I saw, and he said, I'm not, I'm not using anything. Um, and I still haven't got many young reasons I'd like to have more. Can you come out to my farm? Can you have a look and all the rest of it? When I got there, yeah, he wasn't using forearms or anything, but they all have fly tags in. So, you know, he's, yeah. So, no, my, my best advice is selective treatment, really. Keep an eye on them if you've got time to sit out there and have a look at them all. Um, but you will notice that certain cows are more susceptible to flies than others. Um, and, then, and then if you can keep from blanket treating, that's, that's the key. It's a blanket treating that's really problematic. Um, and yeah, so I'm sorry I can't wave a magic wand and say, use this. If I could do that, I'd have it everywhere. I really would, because that's the one thing I get asked is, you know, if, if you're saying, you know, I can't use this, what can I use? And that's the problem. There's more research there, Nuffield students to be, more research into what we can use and what we can easily apply. As I say, it's a bit like the tree tree oil rubbing three times a day onto cows. You know, what can be easily put into that system? Yes? Uh, two things. One, I think is a uh, treat you can use for fly just to do all nuts. Is there a, a, something you can use all nut leaves to make a solution that actually for flies away? But there's the one for everyone to Google later on, I think. Uh, but my question was I know there's a, there's a guy in Australia that's doing it. You can sort of do dump beetles quite post Um You mentioned it a little bit earlier on, but I didn't know if you mentioned it already. Is there the plans for something like that here for areas that have you know low, low numbers that we can stop it? Yeah, our problem is captive breeding them. There's a whole load of issues of captive breeding them here. Um, the Australians bred, captive bred an awful lot of species before they got to the ones they could actually do it with and, and build up and send out. Um, it's, it's, I, I, I think what we've got to do here is just concentrate on the ones we've got first. Um, you will get your dung beetles back. And, and it's just, you know, if you've got your stock, you've got them out all year and you're not disturbing that pasture, if you can get on top of the chemical side of things, they're going to they're going to come back. Um, you'll start with the drainless, 
And if you're lucky, you've got specialists for hanging on and they'll be there. Um, but you'll just increase them over time. And it will happen quite quickly. You know, um, I'm working on a farm at the moment. Uh, they've got a rewilding project and then they've got a regenerative project. And they said, you know, how long will it take for my dung beetles to appear? They went on from the, you know, rewilding project onto the regenerative project. Um, when we put livestock out there, because it's the first time it's had livestock out on its album, gone into livestock. And uh, the answer is, you know, within an hour, within minutes. And the guy was almost disappointed. Um, but, you know, they're flying. And, and they will get there, and you'll get those ones that have emerged, and they're smelling the dung, and they'll just go straight to it. Um, they don't think about the waters or anything like that. Um, when, uh, when we are working with dung beetles, though, they, they, the big problem we've got is that we just don't know as much as we need to know about their natural history, each individual species' natural history. Uh, it's just not funded. And so the work we tend to do on that is, is um, antidotal, really. Um, and it's something we need to get more onto. You, you need to know about your, your whole natural history of your species before you try and do things like, you know, reintroductions and things with it. Um, but yeah, it has been thought about, but uh, there has been a few, few issues with that side of things. Yeah. But we have got them here. In Australia, the reason why it happens so big in Australia is because they have nothing eating the cattle and sheep does um, at all. They were all eating you know, kangaroo and wombat. Yeah. Because our, our dung beetles have been with us for a very, very long time. Um, they were running alongside our dinosaurs and then they disappeared for a while when things got a bit cold. And then when the oryx were out here running around over Doggerland and everything, and everything they were running alongside those as well. Um, so the dung beetle assemblage that we've got here today is pretty much the same, well it is the same, except we lost a few species from the, as we had in the Neolithic when we first started farming. So um, they, uh, they've evolved to eat along the dung that comes out of, of our cattle, sheep, and pigs, interestingly. They will go into pig dung. Uh, the only problem for them in pig dung is pigs will turn around and go to their own dung looking for them. Um, so, you know, that's not good. Uh, chickens, chickens eat dung beetles. Um, so, yeah, I get lots of people say, oh, I've had dung beetles all over my field and I'm rotating it with my chicken pens. Oh, great. Um, you know, that sort of thing. You've got to remember, they are little protein parcels, so lots of things eat them. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, the chuff that was on here, so, yeah, one of the reasons I ended up doing so much work in Jersey was because of these guys here as well. Uh, that's a chuff, and uh, they're doing a reintroduction program on chuffs, and one thing that chuffs like to eat is dung beetles. So very often I get pulled in to increase dung beetle numbers just so that something can eat them. That's quite depressing. Um, but, but that's what happens when you're, you're dealing at the trophic level that I'm dealing at. But, yeah, basically, um, you know, they are really, really important. And the fact that you don't notice them is, is not a problem until they're not there. And then you'll notice you have dug beetles. And, and that's the thing. And, and when we quantify the size of them, when you come over to the stand, I've got a load of them in my box over at the stand, you can see them. And some of them are tiny, but it's the sheer volume of them that's doing the job. Um, and that's the thing. You know, uh, 10 years ago, just over 10 years ago, uh, Emma, Emma Sher um, Sherlock, who's an uh, academic working with, dung uh, with earthworms, she's devoted her whole life to earthworms, and uh, she used to say to me, oh, I wish all ruddy farmers would do more about, about you know, earthworms. No one's doing anything about earthworms. People ought to be considering earthworms more and all this sort of thing. They just think they're small, you know, not really worth it and that sort of thing. And, you know, the and of course there are farmers that know that earthworms are very, very important. But on the whole, earthworms were overlooked. Now you all know about earthworms. You've all got your various apps and digging holes and checking on your earthworms. This is the same with dung beetles, okay? They, they might be small, um, but they do move around an awful lot and they are really, really, really important. Any more questions? Yes? Yeah, I think I got some of that. So dung beetles, yeah, they do have pathogens and, and fungi that attack them. Um, so, and that was a problem with captive breeding them as well, uh, and where we collect them from and everything, because we obviously we don't want to move things around. Um, so they, but they live alongside those because they are they're native predator species, so they've been living alongside it. You get into some interesting things, like the harlequin ladybird, its pathogens are starting to catch up with it now, uh, and that sorts out the, the 
sort of uh, the, the amount of the population that we've got. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question because I didn't fully hear it, but yes, they have got their own pathogens. I would say so, um, but I need you to come and chat to me a bit closer because I'm only just hearing most of it. But yeah, I would say so, definitely on that one. Definitely. Yes. Oh, I'm being shouted at. Last, last question. Last question. Um, I'm sorry, it's harrowing. Yeah. Um, that's wrong. Yeah, so that's soil disturbance, basically. Um, and what you're doing there is you're getting into a vicious circle because if, you, if you're harrowing, you're, you're actually losing your dung beetles because you're, you're opening them up to predators, you're, you're damaging them and everything else. Um, and then you've got less dung beetles, so you've got lower, less dung removal, so you have to harrow more and so on and so forth. So yeah, be patient. Um, the, if you've got one of those things that you can address, please address it. And then just what, just have a bit of patience. Let those numbers build up and you won't need to harrow. And, and that, you know, I've, I've been able to do that on one of my fields. So in my optimum dung beetle field, I don't need to harrow because I've got no dung to harrow. Uh, because it's just gone. And, and that's what you're aiming for, really. Oh, yes. Yeah, leave, the duck, leave that muck on the ground. Horses, just leave it where it drops. Just leave it where it drops. That's the one thing about dung beetles. They're actually living in the dung as it drops out of the animal. They're not in the muck heaps or anything like that. Uh, and they won't go to slurry or muck spread and stuff either. You're going to actually drag me off the stage in a minute. No? no. Right, one last question. Can I ask for one last question? Oh, no, no, I've got two. Um, all right, okay, just one last question. Very quickly at the back there, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm now I can factor to get a chance to sort of totally rock down to the badgers with a bit. Right, is that a problem? Dung beetles or what? They're after your dung beetles and everything yeah, else in there. Not, not a bad person. Yeah, no, um, it's cycle of life in that, that scenario. Um, and the fact the badgers are ripping it all apart, if it's had dung beetle activity and weather. That's the important thing. If it doesn't have dung beetle activity, it won't weather. So if you go out in your fields, and uh, we had that really, really cold spell earlier this year, so there was lots and lots of that dung beetle activity. Dung was being broken down, even though it was earlier in the year. And then we had that really, really cold spell, um, and then it went back to being warmer. And uh, that white, that dung would have gone white in your fields and be hanging around. In fact, you probably find it now. It might even have meadow ants and things inside it now. Um, but the reason that's still there is because it didn't have a dung beetle activity. Um, and the dung beetle activity helps it all break down because of that, that movement they have and, and the fact they're removing all the, the moisture and everything. So, it's, it's, so the badgers are coming in to eat them. But that means you've got dung beetles. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a healthy ecosystem so long as we don't mess with it too much. Right. Okay, I bet go because we're going to go on a...